Well, good morning, Metro Church. Amen. How you doing this morning? Oh, come on. How you doing this morning? Yes, it's so good to be with you all today. Uh, my family and I have been looking forward to this time to be together. We so loved our time with you uh, back in January when we were here for Vision Conference. And now to be here just uh, a few months later, we're just overjoyed and excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Linson the other day and uh, just getting an update on what's been happening in the life of the church, what's going on. And uh, it was just exciting to me. I was so encouraged to hear what was happening here at the church, especially as it relates to Vision 2030. It's so awesome to see how the church, how you have prayerfully and financially gotten behind the vision that God has given the leadership and the church here. And I'm telling you, God is on the move in a special way here at Metro Church. Amen? And I believe this, that there's more that God desires to do. And as our hearts are expectant, as we're desirous of it, God is going to pour out his spirit and continue to do the work that he's begun here at Metro Church. Now, I do think at the outset of the service, it's important to recognize that what's happening here, it's not possible if it wasn't for faith-filled, godly leaders. Amen? And you got some incredible leaders here that are sensitive to the Spirit's leading. They're good stewards of the people and the resources that God has given them. And so I just want to take a moment to just honor and to celebrate Pastor Satish, Pastor Linson, Pastor Jeremy, the rest of the team here. Can we take a moment to just show them our appreciation and our love? Amen. Well, before we dive into to today's text, I've got a question that I want to put in front of you. Have you come across a person or have you come across people that failed to live up to their full potential? Meaning, you look at them and you see where they're at right now, but you also know where they could have been, what they could have been doing, and you see they have settled for far less than what they could have been. Now, I enjoy watching football. Any football fans in the house? Yep, I see those hands. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I'm in good company this morning, right? And this is going to be our year. Do you believe it? Yeah. Nope. I heard no. And you know what? We've been saying it since 1995, but I still believe, hater, all right? <laughs> I was watching a football documentary earlier this year about a player that failed to live up to his full potential. It was a quarterback in 2012 that took the nation by storm. He was mesmerizing fans with his razzle-dazzle plays. He was breaking records. I mean, it was so fun to watch him. He played with so much heart and so much passion. Anyone know who I'm talking about? Any Aggies fans in the house? Johnny Manziel, a.k.a. Johnny Football. This guy was incredible. He, he won the AP College Player of the Year. He won the Heisman Trophy. I mean, he was untouchable. He was incredible. And 2012 was supposed to launch him into an incredible NFL career, but that's not at all what happened. He ended up having two miserable seasons in the NFL, and it was over. It was done just like that. One line from his documentary that caught my attention, here's what Johnny said. He said, I had everything that I thought that I wanted, money, fame, first-round draft pick. When I got everything that I thought that I wanted, I was the most empty that I had ever felt inside. It's sad because what could have been a storied NFL career is now regarded as one of the biggest busts in NFL history. So much potential yet failed to live up to it. And when we come to Ephesians chapter 3, this is what's on the Apostle Paul's mind except he's not thinking about football players. He's, he's thinking about believers, those that are walking with Jesus, those that are in relationship with Jesus. He's so concerned. It's, 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 it's really bothering him that Christians, followers of Christ, are not living to their full potential and maximizing the relationship that they have with God. And so we see that he actually prays specifically about this matter. When it comes to prayer, and you peel back the layers of most people's prayer life, what you're going to find is what I'd like to call a whole bunch of help me prayers. God, help me with this. God, help me with that. And sometimes it's just those two words. God, help. Anybody prayed that before? Oh, come on. Am I the only one that's prayed that? We've all prayed that, right? 
And I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray that because God says in his word, he says, hey, I'm a very present help in times of trouble. So we should pray those prayers. But if our prayer life only consists of these help me prayers, then we are missing out on this powerful mode of communication that God has made available to us called prayer. And this morning, what we're going to see when we look at Ephesians chapter 3 is that the Apostle Paul, through his own prayer, is going to give us a prayer that we should be praying, and we can pray it in full confidence, knowing that God is going to answer it. How do we know that? Because it's in keeping with what already he desires to do in our lives. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to begin with verse 14. Now, the first thing that we're going to notice is this. The Apostle Paul is very troubled by what he's getting ready to pray because it brings him to his knees. I want you to look at this in verse 14. It says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Let's pause right there for just a moment, okay? For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, when we look at that today, it doesn't seem odd to us because it's a posture that many of us pray in or have prayed in right? We see people kneeling in prayer. You yourself might have kneeled in prayer. But in that time, in that day, kneeling in prayer was not the norm. You see, the way that the Jews prayed at that time is they would pray standing up. They would sway back and forth when they prayed. And for someone to get on their knees in prayer, it had to be because there was a heavy burden that was on their heart. They were earnestly praying for something. There was deep emotion that was tied to it. So when we see Paul, and this is he's on his knees and he's praying, you better believe this is something that's urgent, something that's weighing heavily on him, something that is on his heart that he's saying, God, I need you to do this. It says he's on his knees in prayer. Now, I want you to look at verse 16 because that's when he begins his prayer. Here's how he begins his prayer. He's on his knees. He's got so much emotion involved here, and it's weighing heavily on him, and then he begins to pray. Verse 16, it says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, on the surface, when you read that, that sounds good, right? Strengthen me. Who doesn't want strength? We all want to be strengthened, right? God, strengthen me vocationally. Strengthen me relationally. God, strengthen me in every way. That's what it seems like on the surface there. But that's not what Paul is talking about. You see, the first thing that he prays for that we too should be praying for is this. We should be praying for inner strength. We should be praying for inner strength. You see, as humans, we have a tendency to live from the outside in. Meaning, whatever happens on the outside to us or around us determines how we are on the inside. If it's chaos on the outside, then it's chaos on the inside. If things are going great on the outside, then hey, things are good on the inside. And day by day, and really minute by minute, our internal being is being dictated and swayed by whatever is happening around us. Now, as humanly speaking, or, or humanly speaking, that's perfectly fine. But as followers of Christ, that's not the way that we have been called to live. You see, the way that, 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 that Christ desires that we live is not to live from the outside in, but instead from the inside out. Now, just so we're on the same page, let me, let me break down what I mean by the outer man and the inner man. The outer man, the outer being, that's our body right? And our body is influenced by, impacted by what we see, what we smell, what we taste, what we see. Our senses affect the way that our body reacts, right? That's our outer being. That's our outer man. But our inner man, our inner being, this is our soul or what the Bible calls our heart. This is our mind, our will, and our emotions. It's the center of who we are. And so what Paul is praying here as he's praying, that inner man, that inner part of us, that's the part that he's saying needs to be strengthened. And what Paul is praying here, I would say most of us probably have not prayed that way before, right? And that's because typically our prayers are centered around what we're facing, what we're experiencing, what we're going through. So we react to that and we pray for 
what we're facing. We're saying, God, I need help with this, or I'm facing this right now. I'm going through this. And so our prayers are externally focused and not really internally focused like Paul is showing us here. But what Paul is wanting us to understand is that as followers of Christ, if our inner man is strengthened, if our mind, if our will, if our emotions, if that is being strengthened, then it doesn't matter what happens to us. It doesn't matter what happens around us. We are able to face it and move forward in a different way because of a strength that doesn't come from this world, but a strength that comes from on high. Amen? And so that's what Paul is, 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 is alluding to or wanting us to see here. That inner strength, that's what it's about. We've got it wrong. We've made it about the outer being. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. That inner man, if you have strength there, it is a game changer. We're going to flesh that out here in just a moment. But I want to first look at how Paul says that our inner man can be strengthened. Okay? Look at this in verse 16. One more time. Let's look at that again. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now notice that phrase, out of his glorious riches. You see, it's important that we recognize that when we come to God, when we kneel before God, he is not limited in any way, but he has an immeasurable wealth of resources at his disposal. This means that we can come to him with confidence, not, not wondering, is God able to handle this? Not, not, not wishing and hoping, I, I, I hope I can put this before him. No, we can come to him with confidence knowing there's nothing too hard for our God, nothing that's impossible for him. He is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. What Paul is showing us here with this request is when we pray this, we will not be disappointed because it's out of his abundance that he is going to respond and react to our request. But Paul adds one more component there. He says it's out of his glorious riches, but he also says the inner strength is going to come how? Through the Spirit. So that means this isn't a work that can be uh, uh, found anywhere in this world. It's not something that can be conjured up. There's not a four-step plan for, for you to have inner strength. He says, this is a work of the Spirit. It's a work of God. You've got to recognize that. We've got to know and realize there's no other way that our inner man can be strengthened. Now, when you hear that, you might think, okay, Tom, that's great. It's the Spirit's work. So, Spirit, do your thing. Have at it. But that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. You see, the way that the Holy Spirit works, he doesn't force himself upon anyone. But any person that has yielded themselves, surrendered themselves, and really given themselves over to the Lord, having his way in their life, that's when the Spirit is able to do the work. That's when the Spirit is able to move freely and work powerfully in a person's life. You guys with me? So the Holy Spirit isn't going to force it. And so what do we have to do if it's not something that we can earn or achieve or attain and, and there's, there's, there's nothing you know, we can do to make it happen? What can we do? We can position ourselves in the presence of the Lord to be able to receive what he has for us. That's what we control, how we position ourselves. You know, this morning, every single person that's here and those that are watching online, you are positioning yourself for your inner man to be strengthened. As you hear God's word, as you sing these powerful lyrics to these songs, guess what's happening? Your inner man is getting stronger. When you read God's word, when you sing worship song, when you spend time with your life group and you're growing in life-giving relationships and in community, what's happening there? It's going beyond the outer surface and your inner man is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And guess what happens? When your inner man is strengthened, when your mind, your will, and emotions are all stronger, then you are able to move forward step by step in supernatural strength. Amen? That's what can happen when your inner man is strengthened. That's what takes place. That's what it results in. And so this morning, Paul is reminding us and showing us, hey, quit worrying about your outer man to be strengthened. If your inner man is strong, then it changes everything. Now, uh, here's what I mean by that, okay? To flesh that out a little bit more, I talked about earlier most often people live, and humanly, we live outside in, right? So chaos on the outside means what on the inside? 
chaos. But when we live the way that God has designed for us to live, as those that are in relationship with him, the way that, 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 that he has made available to us. When we do that, it could be chaos all around us. It could be pandemonium. I mean, it could be crazy all around us. But if our inner man is strong, it doesn't matter what's happening. We are still able to press forward because our inner man has this peace that is not of this world, but that comes from on high. And because of that, we're able to keep pressing forward. Amen? That's what it means for your inner man to be strong. It's able to not just operate through natural means, but there's supernatural power, supernatural strength, supernatural peace that comes from on high. This is why Paul is telling us our inner lives need to be strengthened. Now, Paul himself highlights this in his own life. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at what he says. He says, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And then verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. In other words, what should have taken Paul out, didn't take him out. What should have caused him to quit, it didn't. He only got stronger. What the enemy thought would be like the end of Paul. He's done. He's over. Mm -mm, it didn't happen. You see, even though his outer self was getting beat up and it was taking the hits and the bruises and all that comes with it, he was still pressing forward day by day, moment by moment, writing letters, building churches, evangelizing, declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Paul wasn't swayed or dictated or guided by what was happening to him. He knew the strength that he had from within that comes from on high. That's all that he needed to make it another day, another day, another day, another day. You think about it for a moment. If he allowed his outer man to guide him, we wouldn't have half of the New Testament. The gospel wouldn't have gone forth the way that it did. Yes, God could have used someone else, but he chose Paul, and Paul said yes. And when he said yes on that Damascus road, from that day forward, his allegiance became to declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And it didn't matter who came his way or what came his way. He was pressing forward to declare Jesus to the world. That's what it can look like when our inner man is strengthened. That's what it can look like when our inner man is strong. We're not guided by what happens to us. We're guided with a strength that comes from on high. What Paul wants us to know this morning at Metro Church on this Sunday in June is this. The same thing that he experienced, he wants us to experience. The same strength that he experienced internally in his inner being. He's saying, it's not just for me. It's not something that's exclusive for Paul. It's available to every single one of us. If we will receive it, if we will live and experience what that's like, our life will be different. Amen? Now, when we continue in our text in Ephesians, Paul tells us why it's important for our inner man to be strengthened. Let's go to verse 16, and then we'll go to verse 17 after that and see the reason. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, pay attention, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, when you read that verse, you may think Christ dwelling in your hearts through faith. Tom, I, I thought you told me that, that this prayer was for believers, those that are following Jesus. When you give your life to Jesus, when you surrender your life to him, isn't Christ already with you? So what is he talking about here? And you're absolutely right. When you do give your life to Jesus, when you surrender your life to him, he is with you. But this word that he uses here, dwell, means so much more than God just, or than Jesus just being with you. I want you to think about it this way. There's a difference between when guests come over to your house versus when family comes over, right? Now, if a guest was to come over to your house and started raiding your pantry and started opening up the fridge and grabbing, you know, different things and eating out of there and, 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 and taking a drink out of the milk, out of the carton, I mean, how would you respond? You'd look at them and say, who do you think you are, right? 
But if family was to do that, you wouldn't even bat an eye. Okay, sure, whatever, right? In fact, if they were to ask you for something, you'd be like, go get it yourself. All right, I ain't going to get that for you. Think about it this way. How do you prepare your house for a guest versus when family comes over? It looks different, doesn't it? Before a guest comes over, you want to put your best foot forward. You want to make sure that they know you are the best family ever. And so that living room, that dining room, that guest bathroom, it is perfectly clean, even though we all know there's that one closet where everything is piled into. And if someone opens that, it's all going to fall out, right? So we get the house all ready. What are they going to think? How are they going to respond? That's how we get it ready for a guest. But when family comes over... You may pick up here and there, but you're not trying to project a certain image. It's, hey, it is what it is. Welcome to the house. Enjoy, right? There's a difference that's there. And the problem is that many Christians treat Christ like a guest in their life when he desires to dwell in their lives. You see that word in the original language? It's this idea of settling down, permanently residing versus temporarily lodging. And what Paul is implying here is when we live from the outside in, what we're doing is our our lives are being guided by whatever is happening to us, and Christ doesn't feel at home in our lives. He doesn't. That's not the life that he suffered and died for you to experience. Remember, what, what did Jesus say? I came to give life and life more what? Abundantly. That's not the abundant life. So Christ is there, but he's like, uh, no, 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 that, this, I, don't, I don't feel at home. I don't feel settled. This, this doesn't feel right. When we live from the inside out, though, and our inner man is being strengthened, here's the difference. Christ feels at home because we're living with this peace, this joy, this hope, this victory that's from within. He is able to settle down. He is able to feel at home because you're operating and moving and living in the way that he desires for you to live. You're not rattled by whatever happens to you. It's not, it, it, it's not affecting you the same way that it does someone else. He's able to say, yes, I see what you're going through, but look at what I'm giving you. And you rest in that and you live from that. And Christ dwells in you and feels right at home in your heart when your inner man is being strengthened. Amen? Let me ask you this morning. How does Christ feel in your life? Does he feel like a guest? Or is he able to dwell in your hearts, in your life. The Apostle Paul is saying, when you pray for inner strength, when your inner man is continuing to be strengthened and renewed and and, and that work is being done, that is the perfect environment for Christ to dwell in your hearts and be at home. Now, Paul continues to pray, and he prays for inner strength, But as he continues, he also prays for this. He prays that we would know and experience God's love. Look at this in verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You see, what Paul is praying for here is that we would not settle for our initial understanding and experience of God's love, like when we first got saved. Like we talked about earlier, Paul's aim is that we as followers of Christ would be growing, developing, maturing, that there would be a deepening that's happening in our lives. And he's talking about it in this passage as it relates to God's love. Now, my wife, Blessed, and I, we've been married now for 15 and a half years. Now, if my love for her was the same as it was back then, meaning since December 27, 2008, everything that we've experienced, the victories, the challenges, uh, parenting three kids, doing ministry, uprooting our lives after the first 13 years in Missouri and moving to Oklahoma, if after all of those things, our love, the makeup of our love never changed or evolved, you would say there's a problem, right? Something's wrong. Because all of those things should have been deepening and strengthening our relationship and our love for one another 
as we have continued to be on the journey. The same should be true as it relates to your relationship with Jesus. If your love and your understanding of his love is the same as the first time that you got saved, there's a problem there. Because the more that you get to know him, the more that you begin to understand him, the more that you see his attributes and his character on display in your life, your understanding of his love should be growing and deepening and getting stronger and stronger. Amen? And what Paul is saying in our text is, when we go on this this journey with him, if our love isn't getting deeper and stronger, there is a problem. And he's saying, I want them to know and experience God's love. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Paul says both to grasp and to know. Okay, he uses both of those words there. Paul is making it clear here. This is something that requires both understanding and feeling. It's something that needs to be understood in the mind, right? The depths of God loves, depths of God's love, the magnitude, the greatness of God's love. It should be understood here in our minds, but then personally, we should be feeling it, experiencing it, and living from it. So Paul says, I want them to grasp and to know. I found in my life that this only comes by intentionally keeping God's love in the forefront of my mind, regularly reminding myself of God's love for me, thinking about where I would have been if it wasn't for God's love, looking at it and saying, oh man, if I love my kids and I love them a lot, God, the good father, loves me even more than that. When I began to reflect on that, that's when my, 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 my love for God continues to increase and I see his love for me deeper and in a stronger way. Until we're doing that, unless we're doing that, it can just be something that's pushed to the side. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. We sang that song as little kids, right? Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so, right? And it could just be something that's there, and we casually approach God's love instead of recognizing the enormity, how great, how magnificent, how wonderful is God's love. And Paul is saying, I I don't want them to just settle for this casual understanding of God's love. I want them to know it and grasp it and live in it and live from it and continue to go deeper and deeper in their knowledge and understanding of God's love. See, when you know and experience God's love, it affects everything that you do. The way that you live, the way that you approach work, how you parent, how you do school, how you do everything is affected when you do it from the place of understanding and knowing God's love. And so Paul is praying, I need them to go deeper. I need them to understand this. Because not only is it going to affect them, it's going to affect them and those around them because everything about them is going to change when they know his love. Well, after he prays about God's love, he gets to the climax of his prayer and he prays that we would be filled with the fullness of God. He prays that we would be filled with the fullness of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, Paul's concern, again, is people are not experiencing as much of God as they should. So he's challenging us through prayer. He's saying we need to be desirous of more of God. We need to to, to seek after more of God in our lives. I heard a pastor put it this way. He said, you can have as much of God as you want. And what he meant by that is this. It's not God that's withholding himself from us. God's made himself available. He's saying, I'm here. All of me, it's available, but the ball is in our court. Unless we desire that, unless we seek that, unless like the psalmist, there's that yearning and that longing and that thirst for God, until, unless we have that, he's not going to force himself into our lives. Like we looked at earlier, right? He says, I'm here. I'm available. Do you desire for more of me? Because if you're, if you're not ready to receive him, he's not welcome. He's not able to, to, to come in and do what he desires. And what Paul is telling us here is, hey, the fullness of God, this is something that's very important that we seek after, that we long for, that we chase after, because God desires to do it if we are ready. Now, 
that sounds good, the fullness of God in our life, right? But if we're able to be honest, most folks would rather take aspects of God that they like in their life and leave the rest on the shelf. Let me show you what I mean. You think about it. We're like, okay, God's grace, I like that. I'll take some of his grace. His mercy, give me a little bit of his mercy. That's good. Provision, I could definitely use some provision. In healing, we need that. In Jesus' name, yes. But everything else, you can just keep that on the shelf like it's the grocery store, right? So we take aspects of God that we want and leave the rest there. But what Paul is saying here is if we want to experience everything God has for us, then we need all of him in our lives. This includes his justice. This includes the conviction that he brings. If we want, if we want to truly experience what God's made available to us, then we need to be desiring truly for all of him. I heard a pastor once jokingly say this. He said, I want to be so full of God that if a mosquito bites me, it'll fly away singing there is power in the blood of Jesus, right? I want to show you what it can look like to be so full of God. Look at this in John chapter 7, verse 38. Jesus said this. He says, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Okay? Do you see that? It says rivers of living water. What's available to us? What's promised to us? Jesus himself is the one talking here. And he said, rivers of living water are available. But you know what the problem is? God has promised rivers, but we settle for just a trickle of water. Just a little bit, right? I'll take a little bit of God. Oops, that's good enough. That's all I want. If you're a little bit holier, you might get a little bit more of God, but then we just stop right there and we settle for that. Now, unlike this cup where you see maybe 25% of it is full, the rest of the cup is empty. But in our lives, our lives are always going to be full. The question is, what is it going to be full of? If it's 25% full of God, then you better believe the other 75% that's there is going to be full of the things of this world. What does that entail? Anger, bitterness, jealousy, envy, strife, pride, all of those sorts of things. That's what's going to be filling our life. But what God is saying is, what did he say? Everybody say, rivers of living water. Say it loud, rivers of living water. See, God is saying, I don't want you to settle for 25%. He's also saying, I don't want you to settle for even 50% of me. It's better than 25, but, but that's, not, that's not the life that I purchased. That's not the life that I, I paid my life for. Not even 75%. Because if it's 75% of God, that means there's still 25% of the world. Everybody with me, right? Get this, though. God is also not saying that we stop at 99% of God. You know what God desires? Here's what he desires. Rivers of living water. That we would be overflowing with God's presence. That we would be swimming in his grace. That we would be having so much of God that we can't even contain it. That his power and his presence is flowing in and through us. This is what's available. But we settle for 25%. God is saying this morning, right here, today, let's change that up. Instead, let's seek God and say, God, I want all of you in my life. The fullness of God is available. Church, it's important that we stop settling. It's important that we not settle for just a trickle of water, but that we seek the Lord and say, God, if that's what you desire to do, then I'm making myself available for you to fill me and the rivers of living water to flow through me. You see, it's not a matter of does God want to do this. The question is, do you want that to happen in your life? It's available. Are you ready to receive it? Are you willing to position yourself for him to do his work? Paul is saying, if we experience the fullness of God in our life, we're not going to be the same any longer. This is what's available. 
Paul is saying this, I need you to pray this way. Because when we don't live with the fullness of God in our life, we're not as powerful as we could be. We're not as victorious as we could be. We're not as strong as we could be. And you better believe we're not as joyful as we could be. But when his fullness is in our life, when we have so much more of God, then we can't even contain it. Everything changes. Everything shifts. Amen? Paul is urging us this morning. If we want to experience life differently, then you got to start praying differently. Let's not just pray for our circumstances that we're praying. Yes, we need God's help in those areas, but don't just settle for that. He wants you to live from the inside out. And he's saying, if you pray these things for inner strength, to know and experience God's love, and to be full of God in your life, you will not be the same, but you will be living truly in the abundant life God's made available to us. But the decision is up to us. Every single person that's here You've got a choice. How much of God do you want? Is it a trickle? Or is he going to be able to overflow his presence in your life? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you that you are a good God. And this morning you're challenging us to not settle in our relationship with you but you're calling us for so much more. There's so much more that you desire to do in our lives. And this morning, we repent. We surrender ourselves to you. And we say, Lord, have your way. We pray the prayer that Paul prayed. And we ask that you would do that work in our lives. We know it's not something that we can do on our own, but today we position ourselves for our inner man to be strengthened, for our knowledge and understanding of your love to become greater and stronger in our lives. And then finally, God, we're praying for more of you, more of you, your presence, your power, who you are to be manifest in our lives. And we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.